I wanted to make sure that the uh, conference conference was going to be recorded. Uh, Channel 18 simultaneously is uh, recording as well. And uh, I'd like to <coughs> excuse me, welcome the members of the committee as well as uh, our our guest. Uh, you people, Mr. Wilson, you've made history. I was kidding, Ken, uh, about this. And I appreciate the fact that, uh, you know, as we've organized this agenda, uh, we asked for public comment at the end of the meeting. Uh, it, it's just meant to expedite, uh, you know, our conduct of the meeting and uh, allow for the discourse of the elected, uh, or not elected, but the members of the committee. So uh, in accordance with the uh, state's mandates, as you know, this is a remote meeting, not by our choice, really. Uh, Town Hall has still uh, guided us in this direction, and that's that's why the necessity of, of a meeting uh, in a virtual sense. Uh, if anyone wishes to uh, see portions of the meeting or it, it in entirety, uh, it'll be available on Channel 18. Uh, there's also a phone connection uh, that was published on the agenda. So without further ado, uh, Glenn, excuse me for interrupting, but I have a question for you. Do we, what is the length of the time interval we have for this meeting on go to meeting? Uh, John, I appreciate the question. Uh, we have been given a dead end uh, of uh, two hours. Uh, Thank you. We will be, and I think if we move through the agenda accordingly, uh, I think we should meet that goal without uh, I don't want to jinx it, but without much, uh, much okay. else. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, so on behalf of the committee, I'd like to, uh, in, you know, thank Roman Greer uh, for being available to us. Uh, I had not heard from Mr. McManus. Uh, so I'd like to uh, move right to the consent agenda. Uh, my secretary, my uh, surgeon, uh, surgeon has not made available uh, those minutes so i'm just going to table that to our uh next meeting after the public hearing on the 20th we should be able to take care care of that uh, without much to do so under new business uh recommendations on rates and fees and uh as i advertised uh, i'd like to take a vote tonight if it's appropriate uh in the packet itself and i i hope everyone has referenced that uh Roman has supplied us with an abundance of materials. And Roman, I'm seeking your guidance here. Your summary of the rates and fees and the recommendations that you're making, I thought were very helpful. Uh, but, you know, we'll start with the PowerPoint and, uh, you know, you can take us into the uh, discussion as you've outlined it in your uh, PowerPoint presentation. So Roman, uh, thank you. Okay, thank you, Clem. Bear with me while I get the technical stuff going here. Yeah. Okay. So I'm hoping, I, I'm gonna assume that everybody's read the package of uh, rate and fee recommendations that I submitted. Um, basically on the PowerPoint, I have a lot of the backup data, but um, that's just to accompany the uh, actual spreadsheet or the actual report that I sent uh, separately. Uh, with the goals, recommendations, rationale, and ultimately the recommendations that I came up with. Uh, I'll start with the um, goals. Um, when I when I set forth to um, put together the rates and fee recommendations for 2021, I wanted to put together some clear goals that we were hoping to achieve. And those goals are to achieve revenue needs without raising Harwich resident annual pass rate. To increase revenues to offset budget and personnel cost increases over the past few years, which total almost $54,000. To increase car rates in anticipation of the new car lease, which we anticipate will be about twenty dollars to $25,000 more expensive than the current lease. And then to adjust the annual pass categories, focusing on Harwich residents and streamlining the other categories. So that was my uh, goal. Those are my goals. I don't know if you wanted to discuss, um, stop for a minute and have a discussion, Clem, there, or do you want me to continue with the presentation? Yeah, uh, I, I think it's important that we're all on the same page, and uh, I, I appreciate the clarity of, of your outline. And uh, I'll just uh, move to the committee 
uh, to ask for input. Uh, Jack Conley, I see your hand up. You know, as far as goals, um, do you have any directive from the selectmen or the financial officer of the town to have the revenue match the expenses, including indirect expenses? Uh, yes, I do, Jack. So, um, the, this town selectman last night discussed the FY21, um, I'm sorry, 22 budget message that their work just dropped to announce. I have not yet received that, but I did speak with the finance director, and she said that budget message, which I'll, I'll share with the committee when I receive it, um, focuses on uh, having departments aim to cover their entire costs. And not necessarily right away, but you know, start in that direction if you're not there already. Um, I did send this presentation to um, our finance director, as I mentioned at our last meeting, I would, and um, she thought that the goals were, were uh, that I set forth and the revenue that I was projecting we would achieve, um, she said would be viewed very favorably by the selectmen, and she thought it was very appropriate. I asked her if we, she thought that we should be raising more revenue towards the general fund and covering and she said you know not in one year she, she said no she said this is she thinks this covers a very appropriate part of our uh, revenue um total, total revenue needs uh, but then again she had questions as well about um you know is there a greater um arrangement with with chatham that we're not aware of that, that is trying to be represented in the chatham memberships and i told her i i'm not aware of that either um any any discussion that i've had uh, with the board of selectmen or fincom uh, regarding the chatham memberships have all centered around it was to stimulate more activity at the golf course and nothing to do with any type of intermunicipal agreement or a uh, higher cause so i hope that answers your question i did speak with the finance director yeah, let me, I, I don't know if I'm able to come, but I'd like to share this spreadsheet that I put together. And okay, I don't, yeah. Jack, could I, ask, could I ask everybody at large, could, if you mute your respective speakers, we won't get the echo that we're experiencing right now. Uh, I appreciate that. Okay, Jack, your comments. Okay, this, this is a spreadsheet, Roman, based on the information you provided this last meeting. And um, and to some extent, I've tried to capture some of the meeting uh, information you provided already in this meeting. but. I think you indicated the, the fiscal here, I don't know if anyone can see the cursor, but this shows the direct expenses, the indirect expenses, the revenue, and I, I have some questions of why such a big difference between your projected, your actual fiscal year 20 revenue for memberships in the based on the numbers of members you said we have, was a, was a significant difference over $200,000, but I assume that may be where in the fiscal year it occurs. But the, right, the bottom line is we're a half a million dollars shot. And I'd be happy to share this spreadsheet with, with the group afterwards. Um, under budget, if you can make some assumptions, and the assumptions are highlighted, uh, you know, with comments. But the so so that's my my question as far as the rates. I'm concerned when when they're not sufficient enough to generate any movement towards. I mean, it goes down a hundred thousand dollars, but we're not really making progress towards that. Um, making it even unless we have about three or four years to get there I, I can answer some questions that you brought up jack i i agree that um the spreadsheet that carol provided in her fy 21 budget um showed the same figures or similar figures 
Um, I am, the numbers are a little small on the screen I'm seeing here. Are, is that counting the, the debt service um, from previous debt as well? It doesn't count debt service. It just counts the counts, but I characterize it in their expenses, life insurance, Medicare, health insurance, and county retirement. And one of my questions there is, I believe there are only 10 full-time employees, aren't there? Uh, nine, yes. Yeah, and twenty-two thousand dollars an employee for health insurance seems very high, um, based on you know my understanding of what health insurance is costs. So yeah, the, the numbers are the numbers that you shared with us. You know, two hundred and twenty-seven thousand dollars from health insurance. 191,000 for, for count, uh, county retirement. I mean, that's for only nine, I don't, we don't pay insurance for the temporary people, right? That's correct. Um, Jack, the one thing that I would mention, and, and uh, so I'm not that comfortable speaking to the, the exact integrity of these numbers, just because these numbers are not taken from any internal documents I have. They're, they're nothing that I deal with right, directly. Uh, these were strictly taken from the finance director's FY21 budget presentation, a slide she had there. So, um, you know, the golf department doesn't pay these direct f uh, fees. Um, so I'm not sure but do you how know? accurate they are. I, I couldn't answer to any of them specifically. So I, I do know in municipal finance sometimes different departments average out other departments. So, you know, I, again, I don't, I, I couldn't speak directly to each employee's specific cost. That was strictly just taken from the town's budget. I'm sorry, Ron, didn't you say that you expected, you, the, the expectation is that we will, this, the golf course will cover the indirect expenses as well as the direct expenses? In uh, the budget message I, I mentioned, um, I was talking, you know, uh, when I get into the rationale in the future, yes, when the, when the, um, that's a goal that we're heading towards. I think I said specifically what we would cover. Um, bear with me while I pull that up. Yeah, and I, I said, I said we'd, we'd cover employee costs, health insurance, life insurance, and Medicare. Right. Um, I, I did not anticipate us covering um, uh, retirement costs. Okay. So, so that's not, I mean, that's still an indirect expense. It is, yeah. No, I mean, I, mean, I, I just, but like I mentioned, um, this is nothing the golf course has ever been charged with covering in the past. I think it's a goal that we head in that direction. And my conversation with the finance director said that the board of uh, selectmen are hoping good, uh, departments head in that direction. But it, her comment was exactly what, which mine would be, which is, uh, it would be detrimental to our rates and fees and our overall revenue if we tried to get there overnight. I mean, I think I think our rates and fees today can't can't support five hundred thousand more dollars in revenue for next year. Right, I, I agree. But uh, is it one year, two years, five years? I mean, the the uncertainty that I uh, or the uncomfortableness that I have is it doesn't seem to be what that move towards that? Does that mean in five years we'll be there, or in three years we'll be there, or 20 years we'll be there? That's that's the only concern I have. And, and uh, you know, maybe they're not stating it, but if they want it, I think they should say we ought to be there in five years, or two years, or nine years, or whatever. I don't care what the number is, but I think those, those decisions ought to influence the rate structure. I think we will get that feedback, Jack. And I mean, it, this is not, um, you know, our rates and fees and budget is approved every year. And so, you know, it's, it's not like this is a expectation that has not been, that has been asked for, that has not been addressed in the past. Clem and I go to before the Board of Selectmen, the FinCom every year and present rates and fees and then have our budget approved. And so the, we've been um, achieving what's been asked of. Um, this, our department is a cost center for the town. It's not a um, enterprise fund. So in the past, we've been asked to cover um, our direct expenses and some of our indirect expenses. I think the expectation is going forward, we'll cover our direct expenses and our indirect expenses to a greater degree, if not to a total degree. But if you cover them totally, that's an enterprise fund and when, that's not something we are. But I think, uh, like I said, the finance director said, 
she expects departments to be asked to go and go ahead in this direction, but not overnight. And I think the rates and fees I re recommended definitely point us in that direction. And she, her comment was, this would be a well-received recommendation. Okay, I, 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 for a second, uh, I, I think we've got to accept uh, that premise that uh, Robin is in conversation with with uh, Town Hall and, uh, you know, based on what's been presented, I think we've got to work within that framework uh, at this point in time. Uh, that historically, as Roman alluded to, it's been my experience in the last five years. Uh, if anything, they've been very pleased about uh, the way in which we have managed our, our operations. So, uh, Jack, a further comment? I, I don't want to... No. I was yeah. up on that. I just think Roma needs clear direction from the financial officials as to how soon we need to get where we ought to be. Okay, thank you. Steve, quickly. Yeah, Steve Bellana. Yeah, and John Crook. Yeah. Um, you know, starting at the top with your recommendations, Roma, thank you very much for doing all of that. But um, I, uh, on, the, on the first point about uh, trying to achieve revenue needs without raising resident annual pass rates, I think we have a very unique situation um, this year that would cause us, in my opinion, to, to potentially deviate from our every other year in terms of increase to the, to the Howitch residents in that we had both, we had two big revenue reduction events, both in the same fiscal year, the tornado and the virus. And I think that because of that, clearly revenue is down. Um, and I think it's perfectly appropriate for us to ask for an out of sequence rate increase um, for, for Howard's um, residents just because we know it's hopefully never ever going to happen again when we have two major uh, um, uh, catastrophes that, that impact revenue so significantly, certainly within the same confines of a single fiscal year. But be that as it may, I'm just throwing that, that out. In terms, of the, in terms of the overall rate recommendations and, and going back to that first goal, if we are looking to focus on Howitch residents uh, as, as an asset for the town and the, and the taxpayers of the town, and we're going to move to a rate structure where it's resident and non-resident, I have a couple of questions or a couple of ideas in terms of strategy. A, don't understand why we have a unique rate for East Ham and Orleans as opposed to that it was just historical. So, so I'm suggesting we eliminate that over a period of time. And then the same thing with the Chatham. We've talked about that many times in the past. But if our strategy is to get one or both of those current membership categories into sync with the non-resident costs and, and, and have a single non-resident category, I believe we should explicitly tell our membership that and pick a time frame. Uh, my suggestion would be three years and say over the next three years, we are going to change the rate structure for non-residents um, for Chatham, East Ham and Orleans so that they equate to the non-resident rate um, uh, after that three year term. And we simply do the math and we take you know, currently Chatham's three hundred dollars less. Um, I'm sorry, is 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 um, two hundred and seventy five dollars less than than uh, uh, the non resident rate. So we simply divide it by three. Uh, we tell them that you know we're going to go up this year by ninety two dollars or whatever it is, and uh, and we're going to we're going to do that every year for the next three years until it equates to a single non-resident rate, and it's going to go up by that much plus whatever the resident rate may go up by uh, during that time period as well. But have a defined strategy with a defined time frame, 
so that people are aware of, of the fact that we're not just making this a one-time thing this year, but it's all part of a strategy to focus on how it's residents, how it's taxpayers, to get the best advantage of a municipal owned golf course by the town of Howitch. And that it is part of an overall strategy that we're going to simply have residents and non-residents and we're gonna do it over a period of time. Okay, Steve, point well taken. Uh, John Crook, I had you next. Uh, it's hard seeing over the, over the uh, graphic in front of me, but, and then John Wheeler. John, John, John Crook. Okay, I, I kind of agree with Steve. Uh, the only thing uh, I think as a committee that we have to decide upon is, is what is our goal going to be? Is it going to be to get the Chatham resident to the non-resident level? And uh, the one thing I disagree with Steve on is over a three year time period, I think we're gonna do it faster than that. If we as a committee agree that the Chatham resident should be a non-resident membership. Uh, that would also coincide with East Ham and Orleans because uh, if we take the current recommendation in Roman's report of $75 this year, that's only a 9% increase in that their current fee right now is 910. So that gets us really in no man's land. I, I think uh, we've probably got to do it over. My, my recommendation would be to do it over two years and uh, I agree that we should be, uh, remove the East Camp Orleans membership as well. And once again, strive to have them become non-resident memberships also. But I think uh, if we're gonna start making increases, let's do it in two, in two steps rather than three steps. Three steps to me is too long. Okay, uh, John Wheeler. I'm um, just reflecting upon uh, John's and Steve's comments, and and I, and I believe in they. But what's unique about us is we've got three different rate scenarios: one for residents, one for well, uh, one for uh, Chatham, East uh, East Ham, and, and Orleans, and then we get non-resident. And I'm going to streamline that, like all the other uh, courses in the area that I've looked at, just have mem uh, residents and non-residents. Now they have other permutations, but early and late and that sort of thing. But I want I want to move toward that as well, um, and perhaps. Uh, is, is, can it be done in two years um, uh, or three years? It, it can't be any longer than that. And we need yeah. to migrate. I agree also that we need to migrate to a resident and non-resident structure and keep it clean and uh, and do it in a stepwise fashion. Perhaps this year we could increase the to Chatham to 75. So now they're equal to East Ham and Orleans. And then next year, okay, we, we start increasing over a two-year period, uh, East Ham, Orleans, and Chatham from this intermediate rate structure, okay, to a non-resident structure be consistent with a non-resident structure. But again, I agree with both of the previous speakers that we need to move Chatham, anyone outside of Harwich, okay, to a non-resident status. And we need to do that. Oh, and we can't let it go out five, six years. Okay, and uh, in essence, what we're, what we're all discussing is, is a realignment of a resident and a non-resident fee period. Uh, Paul White, anything that you would like to uh, share? Uh, I'm just trying to absorb this. Um, you know, this came up in our prior discussions with regard to, you know, reflecting more appropriately what ought to be the charge to Chatham residents. Right. Um, I'm not sure how I feel about um, completely eliminating it. Um, there are relationships which folks on this uh, call are probably more familiar with even than I am, but we do have, you know, intertown relationships, you know, the school system, et cetera. And, um, you know, I wouldn't want to see us uh, uh, create any difficulties in, in that regard, but I certainly defer to the wisdom of those who've been on the, on the, uh, the committee longer than I have. Um, but I just would caution that we should do a little bit of intelligence gathering um, as to, you know, how some of those folks that we work with uh, at the town level would feel about this. Okay, Paul, thank you. Uh, Roman comments, uh, you know, based on what you've heard from the uh, committee. 
Yeah, uh, as far as the time frame goes, uh, I was planning on something uh, maybe a, a little bit more like four years from now, but it, it doesn't matter. I, I, that's exactly what my plan was, was to streamline, get get all these uh, middle group of people, Chatham, East Ham, and Orleans all together, and then incrementally get them into the non-resident rate. I think that's per the, the, the true purpose of what we're trying to do. Um, I would like to do it, you know, in a way that we really engage them and not turn them off to, to um, you know, they're, they're valuable, valuable members to the golf course, valuable to our revenue. And if you pull the rug out from under them a little too quickly, there are other options for them. And, and uh, you know, we, we may not have a chance to, we have to, may have to react to something a little more drastic. So uh, my original plan was to every two years raise them an additional hundred dollars. And by year four, we'd have them uh, extended out just into non-resident zone. But um, um, I think we're all thinking along the same lines. Okay, so it, uh, it appears that we're uh, basically uh, trying to be sensitive to a timetable that works. Uh, any thoughts, John Crook? I think the other thing, uh, Clem, that we have to uh, think about is right now we have that, if we're gonna do it over a time frame of let's say two or three years, uh, we're still gonna have to maintain the membership category of Chatham and East Ham Orleans, unless somehow we can combine Chatham and East Ham Orleans next year. But still, we're going to have to have that separate membership classification. Okay. Because uh, I, I ultimately uh, would like to have a Howitch, as some of the other people have already spoken, ultimately would like to have a Howitch resident membership in a non resident, period. Yeah. Uh, Steve Bellotto. Steve? Steven? Yeah. Um, my only concern with 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 what Roman just last said is that if we do seventy five dollars every other year, then you're talking you're talking six seven years before we're going to get the current Chatham cost equal to the non resident cost, and that's just too long. Uh, Again, I, guess it, it was, um, I don't necessarily disagree with John Crook in saying two years. I had suggested three, but six, seven years is far too long. That's not my idea, Steve, at all. I think this year I wanted to do 75 just to bring the three towns all in alignment. That would, that would put them all together so we'd only have a resident rate, then one middle rate, and then a non-resident rate. Then we could incrementally move that, that middle rate out together, whether it's you know, so they'll then be $100 together more than Harwich. So over the next two years, if we raise that one group $100 a year, we're moving them all together. So I, I wasn't proposing 75 a year. I was just proposed 75 this year to put them all in alignment. Okay, uh, could, I, could I share this thought with uh, everyone? Uh, I think at this time, I, I would entertain a motion that might embrace uh, the sentiment of uh, uh, John Wheeler, uh, John Crook, and, and Steve, it seems like the majority of people who've spoken, uh, just to announce, uh, because I think it's appropriate, that this would be the direction we would be taking, and that uh, we could put that in the form of a motion if someone wanted to make it, uh, that we would be moving toward that goal, Roman, uh, that you have, you know, alluded to or outlined. So uh, is there anybody that would like to Make a motion to that effect, uh, Steve Pilato. Steve. Sorry, Clem. No, I not. I don't want to make the motion unless we're going to define the time frame. We can't just say that this is our strategy and leave it wholly open ended. Well, fine. Uh, our strategy. Think, when are we going to complete the strategy? I think you could incorporate it in the motion. Okay. Okay. All right. Then I would make a motion that we. That we reach the goal of having just a Howitch resident rate and a non-resident rate, and we make that resident, that non-resident rate uh, uh, be equal, regardless of, of where, where down the Cape people live within three years, in, in a three year time frame. Okay, I need a second. Uh on that motion for discussion purposes? I second. second. Uh, who's the second? I was, John Crook. 
Okay, John Crook is the second. Uh, and now for discussion. We should tell our guests now is a good time for them to throw it out too. No, uh, Steve, I, I apologize, but as I indicated, public comment is reserved for the end of the meeting. This is a discussion for this committee. Paul White. That's not uh, yes, um, I'd just like to ask Roman if he thinks that three year time frame would give uh, the course and the staff an opportunity to work with these future non residents in a way that would retain their membership in uh, Cranberry Valley going forward. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question, Paul. Um, I think that would be a challenge. So um, I, I'm, I'm not exactly sure. My original plan was not going to be to, uh, you know, so so clearly announce this, but rather to give ourselves the flexibility to react if, if it turns out um, we have a drastic change in, in, in membership um, where a lot of them, a lot of members don't re-up and all of a sudden we need to react to, to decreasing revenues. Um, I think that by uh, you, by having such a clear defined plan, I, I do know you'll you'll be more um, liable to achieve it, but um, it takes away the flexibility to react. If there are, well, what I'm anticipating, Paul, for next year, I think we're going to lose a lot of Harwich residents uh, that were currently in the fold this year because it was just so hard to get a tea time this year. People may value golf course access higher than you know playing playing conditions in their at their home course. So. We may see a, a some degree of exodus from our, our Harwich residents, whether it's 100, 150. So I, I'd want to retain the flexibility because, you know, the his history is the East Ham, Orleans, and Chatham residents were invited in because there were really stagnant revenues uh, six or seven years ago at the golf course, and um, so my, my plan was going to be to leave us in a flexible zone to be able to react to that. But uh, to answer your question. Um, we could design a strategy to, to try to um, keep them in the fold. Uh, Steve. <laughs> Steve Alato. That was Roman, that was another reason why I was thinking because of the uniqueness of the two, the, the, the tornado and the pandemic in the same fiscal year. Another reason for doing an out of cycle, albeit small, rate increase for Howitz residents is twofold a to hopefully make up some of the revenue that we'll lose because i'm sure we're going to lose some of the chatham and or east ham and orleans members and and b to be frank yes it will reduce membership which will make the course more available to members and i think there's a significant portion of members whose mindset and, and these are howard's resident members whose mindset is I'll pay more if I can get on the course more, if it's easier to get a tea time. And, and so that's another way to augment the revenue drop from losing out of town membership is if we raise the rates a little bit for to, to Howish residents, but we make it a more accessible course to the, to the Howish resident members as well. Okay, gentlemen, let's stay focused on the motion. Uh, John Crook. I just have a question. I think uh, if we do take this strategy going forward, why would we tell Chatham this year that our goal is over a three year period to make it a, their membership equal to a non-resident? This past year, we raised their, their fees from, you know, it was minimal, but we raised their fees. We didn't tell them that we we're gonna eventually uh, equate their membership to a non-resident membership. So, I mean, we've been talking about this for eight years now, uh, maybe maybe six years in terms yeah. of the Chatham membership. And right from day one, the golf committee always had a majority opinion that we should have a higher rate for Chatham than Howard. Right. So I don't understand why we have to explain to them why we're going to raise their membership to a non-resident. It's going to be very transparent when we do it, period. Okay. Any other comments? Jack Conley? Yeah, I think a reason not to tell. I mean, to me, there's, there's, there's no, if, if that's the way we're going to head, which I used to totally support, I think you ought to tell them up front. Give them the, then they can make a decision. Do I want to stay or do I not want to stay? 
uh, John Crook again, and then John Wheeler. The thing is, where are they going to go? Okay, John Wheeler. Well, we know what the options are, certainly. But I yeah. think I, I think we do need to communicate. I need I think to chat them uh, and up front because then we can, we can get let the dust settle as we move toward uh, a more equalized um, resident non-resident uh, categorization. Um, but right now, at least it it reduces the uh, uh, or it, it it brings them in parity with their other brethren, uh, no, namely known as East Ham and Orleans, uh, and so. Uh, I would be in favor of increasing that thing from uh, 835, I'm sorry, 835 to 910 this year for Chatham, and then over the next two years going $100 each year, so they were 1110, so they'd be equal. Uh, have, now back to the point about uh, raising rates. Uh, I've been in other forums similar to this with other organizations where we talked about the notion of increasing rates in a period that has been uh, dealing with, very, uh, with extreme difficulties, and the notion of taking frustrated uh, members and increasing their rates when they couldn't get on this year is like, what, are you kidding me? Yeah. You know, I, I just, I, I can't support that right now. Not not for Harvard residents. Can, uh, would you like to vote on the uh, motion as it stands? Gentlemen, yep. any further discussion? Okay, Steve, if you want to repeat the uh, motion, uh, you know, we, we can get the specific wording uh, you know, incorporated in our minutes, but uh, go ahead, please. So the motion would, would just be the strategy of the elimination over a three-year time period for Chatham, East Ham, and Orleans rates, and just at the end of the three-year period have an adult resident rate and a, an adult non-resident rate, correct? Correct. Thank okay. You. All That's in favor? Aye. Signal by aye. 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 I I need to see hands first so that okay. Uh I'm counting uh it's an eye from for Steve, Jack, John, John Crook. Are you a, an eye or an a nay? I'm an eye. Okay. I can, I just That's can't see hand. your I've got a graphic in front of me. It it didn't show your hand. And Paul White. It's unanimous. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, and Roman, will you know you and I can work together, and we'll you know we can strategize on that as far as softening the blow. But uh, you know it's it's a message that I think is consistent with the sentiment of the committee. So uh, I'd like to move. Can we move on, please? No. Uh, John. Uh, John Crook. Are we going to agree on the rates today? Oh yeah, for sure. When are we going to do that? As as soon as we can, can uh, you know, get to that point, uh, Roman. Okay, so it sounds like everybody's pretty familiar with what I recommended. So uh, that that's, that covers the annual pass portion, I assume. So when we get into the green fee portion, um, I, I propose to increase all primary green fees by five dollars. And then the miscellaneous fees by two to five dollars. I included the rate sheet, um, but I think that this really follows the sentiment and the rationale that I provided. Is that you know when we when we decide to go to a ten minute tea time interval, we're providing a premium experience. I think the market can support it. So uh, that's going to be a primary revenue generator of approximately fifty thousand dollars. And then um, the, the next rate increase I proposed was all card fees by one dollar. I think we already covered this. This will be to offset uh, the, the cost of the new car lease. And then uh, the final one was to remove the member discount on individual range bucket sales. The uh, $3 and $5 structure we currently have is just so far below market value. I think uh, it, it's, it's we can't provide the, the service for that cost. So I think we remove the member discount on individual range bucket sales and um, and uh, retain the, the $5 per small bucket, $8 for a large bucket um, um, pay, pay scale and just have no member discount for it. Okay. Uh, That's then, it. Uh, and now I'll solicit from, you know, each of the committeemen uh, our comments on those. And I think because it's not that complicated, I think we can look at all the fees collectively. And if, 
If there's an individual fee you have a question about, uh, please air your concern. Uh, John Crook. I'm in agreement with Roman on greens fees. I think we should increase those $5. On the cot fees, I don't think we're being aggressive enough. I think we should be going up $2. And the reason I say that is cot fees really, uh, number one, we're gonna be paying for the higher lease on electric cots, which we all agree is the way to go. And on top of that, the extra revenue goes into our infrastructure fund, which is really key to ongoing projects at the golf course. As far as the range fees, I agree totally with Roman in terms of the, uh, the bucket sales. The only thing I would recommend in range fees is that we take the range membership from 250 to $300. Okay, other comments? Uh, uh, John Wheeler. I agree totally with what John Crook just shared in terms of adjustments made. Overall, I think it's a good structure. I think it's a prudent structure with the amendments that John has suggested. Thank you. Uh, Jack Conley? I just have a question for uh, Roman. Is, is the $5 increase, is that all going into the infrastructure fund or is that going elsewhere, Roman? Uh, Jack, I'm recommending that these uh, increases in rates go into our general fund revenue to, to help offset the costs uh, I, I, I started with, uh, help off, offset uh, increasing personnel costs. Okay, so it's not the infrastructure fund or the golf course improvement? No, I'm proposing these could help cover our, our uh, employee costs so they would go into the general fund. Increasing expenses, okay. Uh, Steve Lotto. Um, I agree with with everything that um, that John Crook has said, um, and and Roman's proposing, with again the exception. And to you, John Weller, I understand the, the frustration that members have felt about them not being able to get tea times. But again, because of the revenue shortfall with COVID and, and the tornado in the same fiscal year, because I think we have to anticipate that we're going to lose some members from Orleans, East Ham, and Chatham with our stated strategy of fairly dramatically increasing their rates, that in turn would mean we'd have less members competing for the member times, which means that it inherently should be easier to get member times after we establish that strategy. And that would be a way, again, to make up for some of that revenue loss when we lose some members, out of town members, yet still make it more enjoyable and more accessible by the town residents. So I think we should do a one time, I don't know, $20, $25 increase for the for the Howitch residents too, because of the issues I just explained. Okay. Uh, Paul White. I'm fine with the recommendations Roman uh, has advanced to us. If it's uh, if it makes sense to uh, respond to uh, John Crook's adjustments, fine. Um, I'm not comfortable with increasing the uh, Howard's resident rate this year. Right. And it. So at this point, uh, uh, I think there's enough consensus where I could uh, ask for a motion to uh, accept the uh, uh, fees that are. Uh, proposed by Roman with the adjustment that uh, John Crook made. Uh, John, uh, making sure that I have this correctly, that we'd increase the uh, uh, annual range pass from 250 to $300, and that we increase the cart fee another dollar to $2. Is that correct? That's correct. Do I have one? Can I have a, one question here? Sure. Uh, Roman, uh, I know this is a tough one range approximately, do you know? Sorry, John, I didn't hear the question. Please repeat. How many memberships on the range do we have right now? Golf uh, range memberships. Uh, one moment, let me see if I have that in the uh, data I provided. Approximately. Uh, while we're waiting on Roman, uh, John, I'm yeah. gonna ask you if, if you're comfortable with it to make that motion as I as I outlined. It's, I will. It's, I'll second it. By by making the uh, 
increase for Chatham membership this year, what are we recommending that we do with East Ham Orleans this year? Are we going to increase them at all or keep them at 910? That to me doesn't make sense. If we're going to if we're going to take Chatham up to 910 yeah. and keep East Ham and Orleans at 910, does that make sense? I think they are scheduled to go to 910. No, they are 910. They are 910 right now. Yeah. yeah. So they so you'd have an equivalent rate for all three towns, right? Yes, that's correct. I I think that that creates uh, you know something some degree of equality there uh it might be appropriate to just leave that alone for this year okay i just wanted to address it to the crowd yeah. I, I didn't know what the other people thought of that yeah. i just think it's kind of strange but that's my own personal opinion okay uh, john willard uh, was that a second on uh, john crook's motion uh yeah, I haven't made a motion well wait a minute wait a minute, wait a minute. no no not yet not yet i want to respond to john john crook's comment if i could Okay, go ahead. And that is, I, I think that I think that that leaving uh, Orleans uh, and East Ham at nine ten at least provides a platform to for 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 uh, equality for Chatham, so we can systematically move all three up to the non-member. Agreed. So therefore, I wouldn't change those two. Okay. Yeah. Agreed. Uh, Roman. Uh, can we go ahead with the motion or uh, did you supply a lost track, John? Uh, yeah, sorry, sorry, John, I don't have the data for uh, how many range passes there are. I'm going to throw out a number, 30, 35. Okay. Yeah, small, small potatoes. Okay. You want me to make the motion, Clem? Please, please do. Uh, the Cranberry Valley Golf Committee recommends the following rates and fees for 2021. As far as the annual pass, we make the annual pass for a Howitch resident in 19 in 2021 at eight hundred ten dollars, the same rate as it is right now. We would increase the Chatham fee by seventy five dollars, bringing that to a total of nine hundred ten dollars. We would maintain East Ham and Orleans at nine hundred ten dollars. As far as any greens fees go, we will increase all primary greens fees by $5 and the miscellaneous greens fees by two to $5, depending on the time of the day. As far as cot fees, we'll increase all cot fees by $2. Range fees, we will eliminate the membership bucket fee and go to the small bucket at $5, the large bucket at $8 for everybody. The range membership will increase from $250 to $300. End of motion. Plan. Okay, and a second. Uh, thank you, John Wheeler. It's been seconded. Question, uh, question uh, Paul White. Yeah, there was one other small item which had been part of the recommendation from Roman. It was to remove Chatham from young adult and collegiate eligibility. And we yeah. haven't addressed that if we want to do that. I. Good point. Oh, no, it's critical, but if that should be included in the motion, if, if we're going to do the entire thing. John, uh, would you like to amend your motion to include that? <laughs> yes. I mean, yes. Um, <laughs> I, yeah. I wish we had. I, can we still go back and talk about that? Sure. Yeah, we got discussion portion. Yeah. Uh, I would like to have discussion on that because I don't know if uh, removing the Chatham young adult and collegiate from the Howitch membership categories is the right thing to do only because of where the game is going today. We want to increase young people, young adults to play the game. And I think by raising those fees for those two categories is probably not the right thing to do. Okay. Uh, Steve Bellotta. Steve. Steven. I got him on mute. Uh, I agree. I agree with John in theory. And, and one other option that I had thrown out, um, or I would like to throw out is the young adult. Right now, our young adult rate is from 19 to 30 years old. Any thought of dropping that down to like 25? I mean, if 
I would think that most young people by 25 are, are established and should be treated as an adult. Uh, whereas the kids that are still in school, kids that are still in college that we desperately that we absolutely want to encourage to take up the game. I think that's a different story, but 30 seems, you know, 29 and a half years old seems kind of old to be getting a discount just because of age. Just one minute. Um, I'm, I'm looking at just to try to clarify this because I don't disagree with the first T concept at all. I think that's very important but I see differentiation on the historical data that indicates, as I think someone pointed out, young adult now runs from 22 to 30, but we also have a junior non-resident, which is a very discounted membership, I think at $350. And that would not be eliminated by this motion. We would still have people under that um, age of, it looks to me like 22, would still be able to join. A, and, and please correct me, Roman, if I misinterpret it. No, you're absolutely right, Paul. There, there, there's one large distinction between junior memberships and collegiate and young adult. Junior memberships are very limited in uh, their availability and access to the golf course. Uh, they have no ability to make advanced tee times. They can only fill in on day of play or play as an invited guest of a member. So uh, they have no access to advanced tee times, whereas collegiate and young adults are full adult membership categories that have full access. Okay. Uh, it, John Crook, maybe I can, maybe we can go to Roman for this. Roman, obviously your uh, recommendation is that we remove Chatham from the young adult in the collegiate eligibility. Yes, it is, John. And one, I mean, this really was in the same vein as what we were discussing before about Harwich and Chatham and, and you know, really creating a separation between a, are you a Harwich resident or are you not a Harwich resident? Um, it's, it's hard to have Chatham singled out as being residents in some categories and not in other categories. So uh, this was really in that same vein of, of you know, working our way towards Harwich and non-residents as, as our two categories. Uh, I did. I did specifically specifically say we. I think due to the schools, our first tee program and the high school team, we should specifically keep anybody that's within the Monomoy High School district uh, for junior golf as a resident um, junior, uh, just because they're they're playing in the golf course on their high school teams. They're playing in with the Monomoy Middle School. But um, I was thinking it, it's confusing to have those. You have young adults from Chatham and then not have adults from Chatham. Oh, it's the same with the collegiate. That's a, that's a good point, Roman. Uh, Steve, you had a comment or not? Uh, Roman, uh, Roman already addressed it. I think, I think for, the, for the junior um, Howard slash Chatham residents, the seven to 18 year olds, since they are sharing the same schools, they should be sharing the same membership category and cost. Okay, uh, we have a motion on the table. Uh, John, one last comment. So I will make a uh, amendment to the motion then, okay? Okay. That we will, uh, as far as the annual pass goes, we will remove the Chatham from the young adult in the collegiate eligibility as stated. Okay. Thank you, John. Uh, and a second on that amendment as well i think i need yes thanks Jack Conley. okay uh without further discussion all in favor aye aye aye, aye. steve no uh that's one no vote and uh five yays so the motion passes thank you gentlemen uh and i appreciate the fact that we uh I think this is progressively minded. Uh, uh, it takes us through, you know, what I what I think was probably our most important portion of this agenda, simply because it sets the stage. And I, I think it's it's good for public information just to reinforce. On October twentieth, uh, we'll have a public hearing, uh, you know, on these rates and fees as proposed, and then immediately convening. Uh, a special meeting for adoption to send to uh, the
the Board of Selectmen for a recommendation. So thank you. So the next item of business will be the capital plan priorities. And uh, uh, I'd like to, you know, hopefully vote on this tonight. Uh, Roman's put a lot of work in this. We've, we've had a lot of discussion. So Roman, I turn it over to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Clem. Um, Clem, before you start, could you just, uh, maybe I was the only one, but I appreciate the fact that you've got different color variations, you know, to highlight specific areas. Is there any other uh, important, uh, is there anything else behind that by design that you want to share? Yeah, sure. Words, I'll, I'd be happy to go over the color coding. So uh, the stuff at the top red has been removed from the plan for the reasons stated. No. Um, the category on the left is all funded by the uh, Golf Improvement Fund. The category just to the right of that is funded by the Pro Shop Revolving Fund. The category to the right of that where you don't see any text at all is funded by the uh, Infrastructure Fund um, because, right. because that's entirely dedicated to the Car Barn Project. Right. And then the far right column is funded by our capital outlay line in our budget. Um, as far as the color coding goes, I, as far as you know, the different shades of purple, green, I just use that to separate the years. But um, the, the items uh, at the bottom of the screen that I've listed one through 15, I, I colored them yellow if they're on the plan. So anything yeah. in yellow is on the plan. The, the, the four, five items um, that are not in yellow are not currently on the plan. Thanks, um, thanks so much. Maybe I was the only one, but that was a question I had, and I, I should have uh, contacted you earlier. So thank no, you. That's okay. That. I'm glad you mentioned that because I, I don't have a good um, um, guide to tell you what that all means. So um, in general, Clement, when, you're, when we're talking about capital, basically we're only talking about items over $50,000. Um, right. I put a lot of stuff on this plan as our priority list and you know this stuff can move around. We have a lot of flexibility with this. I have question marks on there. So there's the items for discussion here. Um, the things that need to be on the capital plan are in FY23, you'll see the maintenance truck for $80,000. Um, I'm currently proposing, again, I have a question mark in there because I'm hoping that we can handle that 80,000 with 40,000 out of our budget line item for capital LA and 40,000 from the infrastructure fund. Just hoping that at that point in FY23, I'll, I'll have to do the projections to see if uh, there's an, uh, an abundance of money in there to, to pay for half that truck. So that's one item that will need to be on the capital plan going forward. Uh, the other one is the irrigation upgrade. Yeah. And I took our discussion from the last month's meeting. I spoke again with Carol, the finance director, and discussed, uh, you know, it, it really, the, the committee was right on. I talked to Sean, you know, doing this as an eight to 10 year project is really not feasible. We need to do this one time, one time only, you know, to get, to get it done. Um, so I talked to her about ways that we could fund the project, uh, debt options. Um, she was open to having some debt, to having us take out the debt. Um, based on, I need to get a quote for the uh, system. So what we're thinking loosely right now, it's going to be about a $500,000 upgrade, uh, upgrading all the wires and heads to do it all at once. Um, if we did it over five, eight to 10 years, it was going to be significantly more expensive. Um, so her idea was we could float a five-year bond, um, but she would want us to guarantee the payment of that bond by having a few years um, of accumulation in our, in our um, fund and in talking to sean you know I, I know that there's it's easy to have a quick reaction to this season where we had the drought and we saw some thinning of, of turf on the fairways that system is not uh has not run its lifespan at this point you know we're still in the we're currently in the in the regular maintenance area of you know we lose heads and we have about ten to fifteen thousand dollars a year where we spend to replace heads um in 2025 that system will have hit its 20 year mark because it was installed in 2005 and that's the end of its lifespan. So, you know, I think if we look for an FY24 uh, date to, to put on the calendar for the, um, to uh, put that on the, on the, in the budget and to go to town meeting and to go to the ballot 
to take out the debt uh, service. And once again, Carol, the finance director mentioned that would have to be part of the town's ballot and also approved the town meeting um, to pay the uh, five-year bond to do that project all at once in the year 2025, which would be the 20-year, um, when the, that system hits its 20-year mark, I think would be appropriate. Yeah. So we would need to build some, um, build up the balance in our golf improvement fund um, in order to guarantee that bond payment. Um, but those are the two items. Those are the only two items that would breach the capital threshold. Um, all the other items on this list, um, we have flexibility with. Okay, great. Uh, so in other words, you know, once we, uh, uh, you know, seek, when we get approval, uh, we'll still have flexibility on these other issues so that we're not, uh, we're not hamstrung by that capital plan, correct? The only two items we need to put on the capital plan are the are two items that are over fifty thousand dollars, which is the maintenance truck and the irrigation upgrade. And now again, the, the items I don't want to highlight down there. You know, if, if we want to find a place to put them on this plan, um, so, some of those are significantly more than fifty thousand dollars. So they would have to be part of the capital plan as well. But um, I don't see the funding at this point yeah. um, for those. Um, well, I, I do have uh, some some news to mention as far as um, let me see. And if if you see the top of the screen, the F five twenty one, all the way to the right, and we have the spinner top presser, which was a recommendation by the USGA just a few weeks ago that that, that would be a you know major a tool in combating um, some of the, the turf issues we're seeing. Uh, yeah. Primarily thatch on the greens. Um, that that was just approved as part of our in, equipment lease last night. The selectmen approved our new equipment lease, so we're getting all new ma re, uh, maintenance equipment, including that spinner top dresser. So I'll go ahead and when I get my color coding and code that as as purchased. Um, okay. But uh, looking at FY22 and beyond, I'll take your feedback. I just kind of threw some numbers on there. Some of the question marks I have on there, if you see the second column where I have range net replace and back of range net, the right. question mark is uh, because I really need to check with the finance director to see if that's an appropriate use of the pro shop revolving fund. If, if, if that's legally uh, something that that fund can, that, that the pro shop revolving fund can fund. So I, I have questions about that. I'm going to guess that the, uh, the range net replacement is appropriate. Uh, I remember uh, distinctly that there was specificity as far as the range, its operations uh, collectively. Uh, and, and, and that's why I, I, that's the guidance I, I would assume that you would get. Uh, well, I, I, took, I took a step with that previously, Clem, because I purchased the uh, current T line that we're using on the range out of that fund previously. But there is some vagaries in, in the, in the um, language set up for that um, fund. So I'll, I want to get, um, get, get the, the, the true opinion of the finance director. But um, please give me feedback on the other items. Sure. Uh, not in a necessary order, but uh, I'll start with John Wheeler. Okay, a couple of questions for you, Roman. Um, I see down below in the yellow the irrigation upgrade 5,000, uh, 500,000. We talked about that um, down for FY24 as, cap as a capital item. What happens to the irrigation upgrades until that point? So um, we just continue with the 75 per year until that, then we go for the big chunk or what? what oh, no, 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 no. So there, there's no 75 per year. Basically, we just we have a line item in our budget annually where you know even even in year one two three of the brand new system you need to replace heads regularly so uh, we have money in our regular budget to replace the heads as we as we need to that's just annual maintenance um so uh there's no cost to to the system other than what's currently in our regular budget is that okay i'm not quite sure what that means does that mean that the seventy five thousand does not happen in FY22, right. 23, and 20, 24? That's right. So, sorry, sorry, I should have taken that out. You're right. There's there's no 75,000 those years. Um, we're strictly handling a, a regular line item budget to replace some heads. There's no okay. 75,000 out of the golf improvement fund those years. But but okay. um, one reason right. I may keep that in there, John, is uh, we do we would need to build a balance in that fund in order to guarantee the, the debt payments. Gotcha. So question okay. number two, uh, FY24, back of range net. Uh, is that something that, and we talked about that within the context of the mass ju uh, juniors, 
and then knock them one ball up for another out of the, you know out of the park. The question is, is that is that a significant issue for Cranberry Valley without in, 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 under normal circumstances? Well, that's a great that's question. question. We, we lose a ton of golf balls. Do we lose thirty thousand dollars worth? It's a question. It's a, it's an it's an investment that would pay for itself over 10, 15, 20 years. Yes. Uh, is it an immediate need? No, not necessarily. I mean, I think I think that you know if we have that on there for FY24, uh, I would really scrutinize it and see if there's other ideas we can cut. That that's. We, we had a, a firm quote from a, a range net company to come in and build a six foot high net that would be grounded to the ground and nothing would get by it on the ground. And it would, we would we'd really lose all, we'd, we would not lose any more golf balls back there. But the golf ball cost is not that significant. We spend about 2,500 to 3,000 a year on range balls. Um, so it, it's worth scrutinizing. I mean, there, there are other um, avenues we could go down and try. It's been suggested by Sean that we try hay bales back there. So, I mean, there, there are options. Uh, I, okay. I threw that on there that just because that has been on our list as something okay. we wanted to put on the plan. Okay, and last question here, Roman. On the range net replacement of 35K, is that no. replacing the existing netting or is it placing something which is higher on the backside to protect people on the uplands green, practice green with the bunkers? That number is strictly to replace the current nets. They're they're um, getting close to the end of their lifespan. They've got some holes in them. They're going to continue to de deteriorate. So we could look into. We could have that same company or another company come in and look at um, um, a situation that could mitigate golf balls going to that back green. But that number is strictly to replace the current nets. I just believe. I believe it's a, it's a dangerous situation up there. Having been up there, much flab, flab, golf balls go flying by me. And also, I think it's closed down. Uh, so, you know, at, at times when perhaps it could be open if you had a higher net. Because um, when the when the range is set up on the uh, mat tees, um, slices from the mat tees um, really come into play on that back green. So when we're when we have the tee set up on the mats, we close that back that back practice screen for safety. Okay. Okay. Okay, Jack. Jack Conley. Well, um, did, did we lose a hundred thousand dollars out of our uh, golf improvement fund for the to offset some of the expenses in the town? Yes, we, we did lose it. Um, we we've dedicated to um, paying that, so I, I don't know if it's in there right now or not. But that has been included in uh, yes. So that that's that we we should not expect that to be there any longer. Okay. Uh, John, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Why are the net things in the in this listing? They're not fifty thousand dollars. Just because you want to take them out of the pro shop fund. I'm sorry. Could you say that again, Jack? Why are the range net items? They're only twenty. I can't say thirty thousand dollars or thirty thousand dollars each. Why is it in this capital thing? I thought it was for over fifty thousand. Okay, yeah. So uh, I can explain that. So you, we're talking about two different things here. This is strictly our priority list, where you know we were, we've been talking in the past about what priorities we had and where we wanted to fund them from. That's what this list is. As I mentioned at the beginning, there's only two items that we would need to put on a capital plan. And I don't, Clem, you can discuss if you want to go ahead and, and make a motion and and. I approve that plan. There's, we, we're only looking at two items on that currently um, for the, for that plan. Um, th yeah. These are the future priorities and how we're going to fund them, uh, regardless of cost. Well, you know, to move uh, this along, uh, I, I would entertain a motion uh, to that effect, Roman, that we uh, adopt the two, uh, you know, the two major uh, items for expense: the irrigation and uh, uh, the maintenance truck to uh, be incorporated into the capital plan. Okay, someone would like to make that motion? Someone? Uh, Paul White, thank you. Uh, do I have a second? Second. Okay, second from Jack Conley. Any discussion? Uh, John Crook. Yes. Uh, I'd like to uh, make sure, Roman, I understand what we're uh, putting on the capital plan for irrigation. 
if I understood correctly, the cost of uh, replacing the heads with wireless heads will be approximately $500,000. And we're gonna do that potentially with a five-year bond starting in the year, fiscal year 25. That's correct. Now, in the meantime, we budget anywhere between ten and fifteen thousand dollars a year as a line item to replace old heads in the system today. It yes. will be doing that for the next two or three years. That, that's an every that, that's in our regular budget, and uh, we we plan on that just about every year. Yes. My only question would be, with the heads breaking the way they have, why have we not fixed them like this year too? Why why don't we replace these heads? where we need them on the on the golf course that's that's ongoing john that's that's happening every day every week uh, when we are replacing them well i don't want to put you in the position of answering that question but i mean i don't know how many head old heads that we would replace during the course of the year and uh, obviously there were a lot of heads out there that were not replaced based on the uh, a, a few of the tough spots that we had on the golf course. So I just- Yeah, no, I can answer that, John. This is, this is, this is really go, speaks to how unique this year was. Uh, you know, every golf course in the spring does a lot of investigative work to see how their irrigation system went through, they made it through the winter uh, to start up the system for the year to see what's working, what's not working. In this spring with the COVID closures, uh, we fell behind on doing that. There are particularly some spots on the golf course where we're having particular difficulty. Uh, holes 15 and 16, that leg of the system has been driving our guys crazy. We, we've had um, the, the company um, expert come out to help us look at that from Rainbird. So, uh, but, but still Sean considers this regular annual maintenance. I, I talked to him about it this morning. This is standard regular annual maintenance. It's just happening, it happens much later in the year. Normally this is covered in the spring. I, I think what uh, John's animating is that uh, in a sense, Roman, we just want to be guaranteed that uh, you know, the heads that fail are going to be replaced. And I guess the point is, uh, I, I want to be assured that uh, there's enough money budgetary wise to cover that issue. Uh, if you're confident in that, uh, I think we can go forward with the motion. Uh, Absolutely, 100% confident. Our, our budget can handle it. We've got a line item in the budget. Clem, you mentioned you were talking that you saw rain with a box of brand new heads the other day, weren't you? I mean, we're, we're doing this every day. Yeah, they were. The, it was. Uh, he was incorporating the. Uh, I mean, it's the key component in any irrigation head. It's the solenoid uh, gentleman that drives the uh, on-off sequence for the. Uh, you know, for the head itself, and it also de makes the determination as far as how you're going to open it up. If you're doing a 360 sweep, if you're going a 180 or 240, whatever, whatever the case is, and in those. Just, just because of the, the way the Rainbird is fabricated, they tend to fail and uh, Rain Rider is, is very much on top of that. So in any event, we have a motion on the table. It's been seconded. Uh, I have a couple other questions, Clem. Okay. I didn't, I didn't complete. Uh, my other uh, question would be on the uh, stump grinder which is a $70,000 investment, which I think is very critical for us in the town. Excuse me, John, excuse me yeah. for one second. Because we have a motion on the table specific to including the capital items in the capital plan, I want to discuss other issues in that priority list, okay? Well, that's so, over $50,000 though. That's I, can, I, can, I can address that, John, because um, so I put that in the, under FY22. We're, we're exploring right now doing an intermunicipal inter share based on our intermunicipal agreement with Brewster and Dennis to purchase that um, with a $20,000 contribution from each golf course. So, that was my question. That was my question, Roman, though, because that's why I wanted to bring it up. Personally, I don't think that's a good idea. I think a stump grinder should be the town of Howitch. I think if we go ahead and with Dennis and uh, Brewster on that, I think that's a disaster. I think between the town cemetery, the town golf course and highways and departments, we as a town should be able to afford a stump grinder. 
So we, we, we have pursued that, John, I, I agree with that. The reason we're pursuing it this way is, is that um, DPW is no longer um, seeking it. They, they've been told no, that it wasn't cost effective and they're no longer seeking the purchase. So it's, it's not cost effective for the golf course to buy it strictly for the golf course. Um, so we were looking to share it with the other towns because in reality, we need it for a month of the year. I mean, we, we would really use it for the month of December each year for the most part. So um, that's why we're going that direction is the town is no longer, uh, a town's other departments are no longer seeking to purchase it. I, I thought highways and departments, highway and roads was uh, definitely in favor of doing that, but. And we, and we, we very quickly said we'd throw in our third to, to, of, of the cost of it and uh, they're no longer pursuing it. I think the selectmen told them to pause on it. Well, uh, well I just think that, you know, if, uh, the towns of Dennis and Brewster even went with a proposition like this. Everybody's going to need to use it at the same time of the year, because I'm sure their golf courses are going to need it during the months of March and April, just like we are. So, I mean, it's going to be a, a situation who gets it then when we really need it. Well, well, we do. We currently do an intermunicipal agreement with them on um, aeration, and we have no problems at all. You know, sh sh sharing times and scheduling items with them. But I agree. I mean, this this is in the um, uh, end of the line. This is just something we're currently pursuing. Um, I, I don't think it's cost effective for the golf course to um, pursue purchasing this on our own. Uh, and then, you know, I mean, I, I could probably project out what could happen if the town of Harwich purchased one from just the golf course. Maybe now it would be the town of Harwich's property and we'd have a hard time getting it back from other departments. I, I don't know. Um, but we thought this was a fair. When we had um, a share of a stump grinder two years ago, we had our assistant superintendent, Rob, got on it for two to three weeks in December and took care of 200 stumps. Right. So, I mean, that's really all we need. Uh, Steve Bellotta? Could we could we do something as simple, Roman, as just write a letter with that that signed signed by all three towns golf uh, all three towns that are participating that says that each town would have the ability to use the stump grinder uh, one month per quarter. It'd be very easy. We we the the uh, intermunicipal agreement I'm referring to is already in place. We already have an agreement in place. There's no problems whatsoever in that agreement. The one uh, issue that slowed this conversation down a little bit is the town of Brewster has a brand new superintendent that's just getting his feet wet in his job and uh, and was hesitant to give the go ahead right off the bat. So uh, he's pursuing all the proper channels to get the approval to do this. For, uh, and it, once yeah, he gets that. I'm just thinking that way. Every every all three towns would each we we each have the opportunity to find a month with it. For, would have the opportunity to have it four months out of the year. So well, I, don't, I don't I don't see any problem with the sharing. If the purchase is approved, I don't see any problem. Okay, I'm I'm watching the clock, people, and uh, we we have a motion on the floor. Paul White. Yeah, very quickly, um, if I could, I appreciate the fact that our priorities are reflecting our prior discussion, particularly with uh, reference to the urgency in the sense that we really do need to put a heavy investment in the irrigation issue. The one clarification I'd like to have Roman share with us is, um, is Sean and his staff comfortable that the, you know, that annual amount needed for maintenance and replacement of heads and other ingenuities uh, by our superintendent and staff will allow us to stay, to, to be able to kind of triage the situation we've experienced this year and going forward until we get the full replacement. Yes, Paul, I can address that. I, we, we, Sean and I had a very clear discussion on this this morning, but we've also talked about it many times. Um, he, he considers the issues we're dealing with on our irrigation system currently just standard issues with a 15 year old system and we have all the proper resources in our budget. Uh, he's got absolutely no problem maintaining the system and he thinks the plan of replacing the system in year 20 is the proper plan. Uh, Jack Conley, quickly. Yeah, just a quick question. Roman, the heads that you replace, that will they need to be replaced again when the uh, irrigation system comes in? Or can you put in a head that'll work with the new irrigation system? 
Yeah, so the, the current heads we're replacing, they, they individually, Jack, they're not that expensive. And um, the um, the new system will be all new heads, all new wiring, so they, they, they won't include what we're currently replacing. Okay. Okay. Uh, so we have a motion on the floor uh, uh, to accept and approve the uh, uh, two items to be placed on the capital plan. Uh, all in favor? Ayes. Aye. 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 Okay. Uh, John? John Crook, was that an aye? Yes. Okay. Right. Uh, it's unanimous then, thank you. Uh, we have uh, all in favor. Uh, as a footnote, people, uh, and it's personal, and everyone will probably smile, but I am very adamant about uh, the stump grinder uh, as well, because not only do we have 300 stumps on our property, I had the uh, opportunity this afternoon uh, just by circumstance, I was checking in with Channel 18 to ensure the uh, integrity of our meeting and the protocols and everything be in place. And I bumped into the director of the Howard Cemeteries. Her name is Robin Kelly. If you remember, and, and Roman, I'm just throwing this out as an idea. Robin expressed to me her uh, absolute uh, displeasure with the fact that, uh, you know, the selectmen have not in, in her estimation, uh, and I don't mean to speak for her, but have not uh, acted appropriately, 400 trees were downed in Howard cemeteries. She is a perfect ally for us to go forward with perhaps the purchase of a stump grinder. Uh, I think that Highway, uh, in particular, John, has been frustrated because of, you know, the lack of action, but uh, rather than lose an entire winter, like we did last winter with the inability to work on stumps. Uh, I, I think it's worth the effort in the next couple of months to perhaps, you know, take a look at this again. Uh, I know that we have a, a sympathetic ally in the cemeteries uh, and I'm and I'm sure that uh, I've got to feel that Link would be disposed the same way. Uh, it, it may have been frustration over you know, the COVID things and, and everything that's gone on since the tornado, uh, you know, it's been like a landslide, but uh, I, I'm just offering that as a, as perhaps a, a point uh, to be taken. I mean, Clem, I can assure you, we've made it clear among the, the town people, Link and Robin as well, uh, that we are very willing and able to um, pay a third of the, the stump grinder. I mean, they, they know that when, when Link first brought the plan to the selectmen last year, that, that, that he had our third dedicated to it. We were ready to go. Yeah, because, uh, you know, when you look at the uh, prevailing wages okay, that have to be paid, you know, to have outside contractors, my God, the thing would pay for itself 10 times over. So uh, okay. without further ado, people, we can look, uh, you know, we can continue to look at these priorities as far as the capital plan is concerned. And, uh, you know, I, I'm glad we have a, a running record of this uh, in place. So uh, I believe that takes us to the, uh, and everybody's read the documentation, it would take us to the hot stove uh, compensation uh, and adjustment uh, as, as a possibility. Uh, so Roman, if you'd like to speak to this, uh, I'd, like to, I'd like the committee to weigh in and uh, you know, perhaps uh, approve this so it can go to the selectmen for consideration. Sure, I'll be brief, Clem, um, because I know everybody's had the documents for two months now. Um, just to recap, uh, the selectmen did accept uh, your recommendation um, for Bob Miller, uh, the adjustment on his lease payment. So um, that already occurred. Now uh, they're, they're just awaiting the committee's um, recommendation on the hot stove. The recommendation is that the hot stove would pay $2,000 rent for this year, its fifth year of its five-year lease. Um, the 2000 has already been paid. Um, so um, they're looking for that kind of reduction in rent. Um, basically, um, based on, yeah, I think you, you've all read the, the letter from Ron Leidner. Uh, he's had terribly lo low uh, revenue and he's got a decent amount of overhead. Um, considerations in this, I mean, we're just about to go out to bid for a new 
restaurant vendor and we hope to re-engage Ron. I mean, I, I, I would, it would be my primary hope that uh, he's the one that would, we, we would re-engage. And uh, in my um, initial conversations with him, he is truly on the fence. So I'll leave you to that, Clem. You can take it from here. I think everybody's read the information. Okay, I, uh, I'll tell you in good faith, uh, he has been a, a wonderful partner uh, uh, for Cranberry Valley. Uh, I think it's part of our, uh, you know, member and guest experience that uh, has a lot of credibility. So I would probably accept uh, uh, Paul. Breaking up, Clem. Clem, um, I've um, been utilizing the golf course for a number of years. The presence of Ron and his people have been an enormous uh, contributor to the uh, good atmosphere at Cranberry Valley. This has been an extraordinarily difficult year. It's one of the only places where I have eaten outdoors um, when I have played golf, uh, either having breakfast or lunch later. I trust the way they've sanitized everything. They've tried to really work with all the restrictions. I think this is not an unreasonable request and I would make a motion to approve it. Okay, thank you. And a second. Second. Okay, uh, John Wolo. Uh, any other conversation or discussion? Uh, Steve. Do we know if Ron did seek and or receive any of the small business loans that were made available due to the, the, the pandemic? I, I can't remember, uh, Steve, if he referenced that in his letter um, at this point. Um, I'm not no, sure. I got the letter. It was no, it didn't say anything about it in the letter. Okay. Yeah. I'm not sure then. I wouldn't want to speak for him. Yeah. John Wheeler. I would just uh, we take us back to the last time we put out an RFP for someone to come in and run uh, the concession at Cranberry Valley. And I believe there was one respondent and, we're, and we're, that's the one we're talking about. So the likelihood of us going out and issuing an RFP for someone who already has a history and has established a reputation uh, to, to a degree, okay, Cranberry Valley is something I'm not sure we want to we want to proceed with. I think we want to stick with who we've got. It may not be perfect, but it's a lot better than we, than we might be otherwise. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for those comments. Uh, any other comments? Okay, a motion on the table. It's been seconded uh, in favor of uh, uh, compensating and adjusting our uh, uh, relationship with the hot stove. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Show of hands. Okay. Uh, those opposed? Any opposed? Okay. Uh, hey, we have one. I'm opposed. One. I'm sorry. I'm opposed. Yes, understood, Steve. Uh, for the record, uh, Steve Bellotta is a nay, and uh, the motion passes. Uh, five one. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Frank Quinn, excuse uh, me for a minute. Uh, do you mind if I chime in with something here? Sure. This may be an appropriate time to um, to build off of what I just mentioned. Um, we're about to start seeking ha having to seek new leases for both golf instruction and restaurant. Um, right. Seeing, seeing that both our vendors are reaching the end of a five-year agreement. Um, so I, what I what I propose to do is. I'll share with the committee the current leases. Um, I have discussed already with the um, procurement town's procurement agent. We're going to have to go out to bid on these. Um, so if I'll share, I'll share tomorrow with the committee the current leases. So everybody can review them. I think Clem, at the next committee meeting, um, you should put an agenda item on the on the agenda um, where we discuss any changes we want to put in either of those. Um, the, the uh, restaurant lease will need to change pretty drastically just because it's going to re represent uh, now a turnkey operation. So I've got to go, go through an inventory every item that has been purchased by Ron and is now owned by the town. So th those items are going to have to be updated. Um, I think the golf instruction lease um, does not need to be changed at all. And uh, Ron, and uh, I'm sorry, Bob Miller has already uh, in his letter that he sent to the committee um, shown his interest in, in renewing for three years. So that one should be fairly easy, but uh, I'll share with the committee tomorrow. If you don't mind, I'll share it with you, Clem. You can pass it along to the committee, uh, the two current leases so everybody can review and we can discuss next month. Absolutely. Uh, and I'm glad you brought that up. It's 
it, at least in my estimation, it's hard to believe it's been five years uh, in a sense, and, and then we're at the uh, point of renewal. So uh, that brings us to all business people. And uh, uh, I had the pleasure today of, uh, at least I noticed, uh, and I'm sure some uh, may have, but it was pretty exciting. I actually saw some flags in the ground our friends from Green Skies are on the property and uh, their their presence and their footprint is going to increase uh, as the weeks go along. So Roman, I'll turn this over to you. And uh, you know, if you have any questions, people, it's 5.30, we're in pretty good shape. I wanna make sure that I get to the last item too. Uh, thanks to Jack Conley, I'm gonna call on Jack. We have some uh, uh, Chelsea recommendations to improve and enhance, uh, you know, sorting out the availability of tee times. I, I think the membership, meaning the annual fee players, will uh, appreciate this effort. We are, we are certainly sensitive to some of the issues that have come forward this year as a result of the demand for play. Uh, Steve, quickly, thank you. Um, I, 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 I wanna keep track of the time. We need to hear from the public before the meeting ends as well. We have people that have attended. They should be heard. Yeah, thank you. I understand that. And that's why I've, uh, you know, tried to expedite things here. So uh, the cart barn progress, uh, Roman? Yeah. Gotcha, so I'll go quickly. Um, so yeah, as Clem referenced very excitingly, we had a pre-construction meeting with Green Skies and Kobo, who has been out of sandwich. Um, who is the utility construction company that's been hired to do a lot of the work. Um, they're now on property. Um, we have a surveyor that's actually a member of ours, Tom Stello, has been hired by Green Skies. Um, and I think they've even hired another one of our annual pass holders to be an electrician consultant on the, on the, on the project. So um, that project is moving along on, on schedule and um, uh, they'll be moving in, in over the next few days. A lot of fill, they're gonna work in the on the um, ground mounts first. So you'll see them down in that hollow. And I, I think according to their plans, uh, we're gonna see some very, very quick progress down there. So uh, that's exciting. And we're once again, expecting an early December um, completion of their projects, which will include the three phase power to, to the car barn, uh, the new transformer and uh, the uh, fully electric, uh, fully operational um, solar system. Okay, great. Uh, and also, Roman, could you speak to uh, the ongoing issue of hardscape and paving and landscaping yep. as, as part of this plan? If, if you don't mind, Clem, again, I'll go quickly here. But um, so we've got a lot of items. I'll, I'll cover more than maybe just this car barn plan, but all of our current procurement needs. We've got a lot of procurement needs on the table. There's been a definite, in my opinion, a definite change in, in um, the way that procurement's being expedited through the selectmen. The last night they approved five contracts, I believe, including our, our new uh, equipment lease. So I think there's gonna be some progress being made on procurement finally, and then that log jam will, will uh, subside. Uh, so I now have a every Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock meeting with our procurement agent, and we have a time schedule to handle all of our procurement needs, um, but we're taking them one at a time. And the first one, as I mentioned in the last meeting, um, our plan to kind of chunk out that project did not come to fruition and that uh, no bidders came to the table to place a bid for our hardscape. So um, that was a plan to really keep costs under control and basically keep the project under our own control during golf season. Um, we, as I mentioned last meeting, we're now going to bid on that. It's gonna be more expensive. We're expecting possibly 70 to $80,000 cost on the project, but the definite, the plan is it will get done. I've got a timetable from our procurement agent on uh, when that's happening. The bid will be the bid package will be posted on uh, the 22nd of this month, and then in anticipation of a, uh, we're going to have a mandatory walkthrough with any bidders. And let me just check my notes here um, for what they were planning to. Uh, oh, okay. And then on November 16th is the plan to award the contract uh, by the selectmen. Yeah. Uh, we're going to set a uh, completion date of the end of February for that. 
and both Sean Fernandez and our town engineer are confident that with the November 16th award date, there's plenty of time for the um, to get the paving done before the plants close, and that would give them time uh, after after you know Christmas months to finish the hardscape. So um, that's exciting progress. I know it's been very delayed, but I'm glad to have specific dates. This has been moved to the top pro of the priority list. Um, because of that, the uh, procurement agent, you know, he's doing procurement for all the town departments. He's only able to handle one of our procurement needs at a time. So on, in my meeting with him on, uh, it's gonna be um, October 20th, 20th, I believe is the Tuesday. Uh, he's gonna have already sent everything into the newspapers to post this bid. Uh, we're gonna then talk about the next bid, which is gonna be the charger grid. And we've prioritized that ahead of the, of the bunkers because once again, he's, he's only able to work on one at a time. So we're gonna go right to the charger grid on uh, October 20th will be when he starts preparing that for publishing. Um, once again, as I mentioned, we have an electrical engineer on board that's assisting with that project. Um, but uh, I'll have more news at the next meeting on how uh, that meeting goes with, uh, with procurement. So that'll still leave the bunker renovation um, project as, as the next one we'll address once the, the uh, charger grid gets posted. Okay, um, uh, after that, he's got, we've got the three leases to deal with. The, uh, my, my, my Tuesday meetings with him will deal with golf instruction, restaurant, and electric cars. So we'll tackle those in order. Okay. Uh, but, that's certainly good news. Uh, I can take a couple of quick comments uh, relative to the cart barn. Okay, if there's no discussion, uh, uh, Jack, I'm going to turn it over to you. And Jack, uh, it may be your microphone, but... Uh, you know, hopefully you can give us a summary of your recommendations. I mean, everybody's read those. Uh, I, I would just make the comment that probably we would like to wait uh, to adopt all these recommendations uh, when Roman and his uh, management team uh, weighs in as far as penalties, Roman, uh, that you alluded to that would be, uh, uh, you know, accrued or attributed to certain actions taken by members. So Jack, go ahead. Yeah, Roman, I, can you bring out that slide? I think you had that. Yeah, these were, Roman and I met last week, and these are some of the recommendations that we are going, or that he will be implementing in uh, the Chelsea system for next year. Um, Some, some you can you can read that one is a half point for early nine play, a full point for in season rounds. And this is up till three three o'clock now. It's two p.m. currently. A half point for for in season rounds after three p.m. Season is defined as Memorial Day to Labor Day. Um, off, during the off season, the full point for before and a half point for after. We're going to introduce penalties for no show. Um, guest points will also be uh, applied to a person. Um, right now, you only can one a member can only invite one guest, but their their points are not counted. Uh, the guest points, so we are going to count that as part of the placement on the T sheet. And finally, I think the last one, Roman, and I think we agreed that you can replace a member with, you can swap out a member for another if the proposed new member has equal or lower points than the person on the T sheet. Uh, yes, that's correct, Jack. And then, so uh, as you mentioned, Clem, you know, I, I put number eight in there just as an example. Um, I, I'm going to work with our golf staff to put together a comprehensive policy that I hope to bring back to the committee next month uh, for, for your reading. Yeah, and it, as a matter of good faith, uh, I think the uh, membership at large should be uh, impressed with the fact that we're trying to uh, tweak the system, you know, to ensure uh, as much as we can, you know, yeah. uh, a level playing field for all. Uh, yeah, I don't want to point out there's no silver bullet. I think this may improve some situations, but there is no silver bullet. I think it's 
you know, coming, having talked with Roman, I mean, the, the demand for the tea times is, this year has been really unprecedented. And I, that's a major contributor, but I, I'm, I'm, and I think one of the things that he and, and he said, and I, and I agree with, is that the Chelsea system is applying the rules in a standard manner. So, you know, there's a lot of frustration about not getting tea times when you want, but the, but the consistency that's been, it's been applied is, is there. So, um, you know, hopefully this will make some dif difference. I don't know if there's any other suggestions people have that they wanted to add to this list. Yeah, I, well, I think it's a step in the right direction. I, and, uh, and it shows a, a degree of sensitivity uh, by the committee to, you know, at least, uh, shed some light on this. Uh, John Wheeler? Um, just uh, I want to make a comment on number eight. Um, I've seen situations where um, members will come in, three members will come in and someone else will substitute for the fourth party. And uh, they have been checked. There's a chance that they have, that one person might have checked all four players in, as opposed to requiring as policy dictates that each person go to the window to check in. So I think, I, I think there's some of that going on. I can't tell you how extensive it is, uh, but I think some people are getting around that. Um, and so the notion of, of, uh, of, of implementing number eight, uh, it, I'm just saying people are working the system here. Okay, point well taken. Any other comments? Okay, excellent. Uh, can I just have one thing on that, uh, and, then I'll, and, I'll, and then I'll stop. And that is, I think that um, I've had a situation where, is, is it Ed at the, uh, the starter shack? Yeah. Okay. Yes. He, he said, he is, uh, you know, you go walk up to him and he says, I'll check you in. And I don't think he should be doing that. Okay. Uh, further comments? Paul, I saw your hand, maybe. Okay. Uh, John Crook? No comments. Okay. Uh, well, that concludes the, uh, uh, you know, bulk of the agenda. Uh, Thanks for your understanding, and uh, I think we accomplished a lot tonight. Uh, this opens up uh, our last segment of the program to uh, public comment, and uh, thanks for your uh, patience. Uh, if anybody would like to weigh in, and I, I apologize. I see Mr. Uh, Dixon uh, on camera, but I've got a lot of... Oh, okay, here we go. Uh, I... Okay, I've got Mr. Dixon and I've got Mr. Uh, Wilson uh, and I have Fran and I have uh, someone unnamed, uh, which is fine. Perhaps you can announce yourself. So immediately, uh, any comments that you'd like to share? Uh, Ken, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, Clem. I'd, I'd like to thank all the members of the golf committee. This is a laborious process and I think you're handling it very well. So sometimes it's tough to keep those discussions, so I'm impressed. I have two comments, one of which relates to the charter for that the golf committee has, because it specifically relates to Chatham Harwich regionalization. And if you're going to be consolidating memberships to two levels of members or non-members, you may want to consider revising or at least looking at the wording in that in your charter. First one. And the second one, uh, as I listen to the the Chelsea changes that you're proposing, um, the only one that's missing in my mind that would be improving for members is releasing of the tee times. There, as I understand it, having talked to several golf staff and Roman, maybe you can attest to this, not all of the unused tee times are released at 6 p.m. the night before. That prevents members from being able to go online and, and fill those tee times. Some of them are, but they're not all being released. I think members would be very pleased to know that any unused tee times were actually going to be released via the Chelsea system the night before play. Okay. Uh, sure, I can answer to that, Ken. Would you like to respond? You know, I can answer to that. So um, we currently release every tee time that's a full foursome, Ken, to the membership. And the, um, the one restriction we have is we cannot release partial tee times. That's just strictly a Chelsea uh, system um, quirk that if we release the change the restriction on those times, it drops the people that are currently in them. So if the public public 
had books a two swim say in a spot and we changed the restriction over to allow members and it, it drops the, those two people so the only thing we're allowed to turn over is completely empty foursomes and our policy is uh, at six o'clock the night before to turn over every empty foursome and then how do members fill in with those two sums room we call the pro shop in the morning okay uh thank you ken uh, just a quick question you were relating to the town charter yes yes okay thank you uh anyone else uh in the audience uh okay dave Mr. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you. Uh, and to all the committee members, this also has been very interesting. So uh, I appreciate the support that you've done for the motions to uh, to up the Chatham fair. I think that's great. Uh, and I do agree with the comments that it should help, uh, you know, create a few more tea times. If, if, even if we lose a few more people, that also has a sort of secondary benefit. And so on the tea times aspects which you all noted was uh was really a, a sensitive issue for the town members this year you had blocks where you had you know one or two hour blocks where the members were not allowed to book until maybe you know the night before or the day of in the past you used to have sort of like an every other tea time allocated for town residents so losing those key hours of the day for members didn't seem to be fair uh, this year. Is, is that going to continue to be the process? Uh, Roman, your response? Sure, I, I'd be happy to answer that. Um, David, we, we switched from the every other um, tea time model about five years ago. And uh, that was, you know, we were at 50-50, obviously, distribution when it was every other tea time. And um, we went to blo the block system where we have protected, you know, there's a lot of benefits to members where there's a, it's a um, protected block in the mornings. It's um, basically a members only golf course at this point in time. And um, it allows us to book non-member groups together because more often than not, when non-member groups want to play, you have you know, buddy trips, wedding parties. Um, they would not book when every other tea time was a member, non-member, member, non-member non tea time. So um, we, five years ago, we moved to the um, block system, and I, I, I think it's worked great. I think we've received a lot of good um, credit. I, I do know a lot of members will say, yeah, but I like 930, and 930 is part of the non-member block. Um, you know, everybody, everybody has a different favorite time, but um, I don't anticipate changing uh, the block from the block system. I think it's been very positive. I, I understand your, your argument for the, the booking of large groups for the non-members and that makes sense but losing from nine to eleven and then from one to two it seems like while well, everybody has preferences you know you just lost the bulk of the day for residents for members i should say so <clears throat> i get the idea of the blocks but the, the amount of hours dedicated to non-members seems excessive it's, I, I think that the um, you'll find that the revenue needs for our current business model, um, we, we, you know, when you, as you referenced, we used to be 50-50 in members, non-members. Um, we're now more of a, I think I had a slide earlier that showed uh, in 2019, 69% um, of the tee times went to members. So we're doing a much better job getting members on the golf course. We do need those non-member tee times in order to uh, fulfill our revenue needs. Okay, well, I understand the point. Uh, in the time we have, I'd like to make one other point. Uh, somewhere in the documents online, I saw reference to the, uh, the changes for the tee boxes uh, that was made by the architect, particularly uh, in shortening the tee boxes for the ladies to get it from what many considered to be, and the architect agreed, an excessive 5,500 yard course for the red markers bringing it down to what would typically be a 5,000 yard course. Yet I don't see any of that money allocated in any of the improvements or the capital plans. Can you speak to that? Do you want me to take this one? I, I'd, be happy to, yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to take this. Um, we, we had in the past um, what we called the Munjum T plan on our capital plan, and it's a quarter million dollar project. And based on um, the reprioritization of the irrigation system needs, 
uh, we've now bumped that off. So that, that, that is one of the projects that when I showed the priority list, it was one of the um, projects that was on there, not highlighted as not being on the current plan. Um, but um, that's something we, I, I, I think we're a better golf course with it. It's, it's just a quarter million dollars where, where, we, where we choose to fund it. Well, I think you have things in there that people clearly question those questionable values, such as such as the back of the range net and some of the other items. And I think you've got an opportunity here to improve the golfing experience for the growing members of people that use the red tees. And I think you're, you're missing out, you know, membership revenue for the fact that you're unwilling to make the course accommodate those users. Yeah, I think that's a point well taken. I think that the, it, we, uh, we engaged that plan with Mark Mondrum because um, based on some USGA data we received that, that it is clearly says uh, it'll be a better golf course and it'll accommodate more segments of the population if we do um, do that T project. So I, I do hope to, to, that we can fund that in the future, absolutely. And uh, Roman, if I can uh, gently speak in, I, I think that, uh, you know, the T box renovation, Dave, along with our uh, initiative regarding a, a junior course and, and a, and a uh, excuse me, and also the uh, putting complex, uh, you know, those are visionary things that, uh, you know, fit into uh, a, a bright future uh, for Cranberry Valley. It, it will, you know, bring us perhaps to a maximum uh, a point of impact with membership and uh, I, I just want to mention one thing, Dave, uh, and that because I don't participate, uh, I wish I could be two places at once, but I'd kind of like to refer to uh, or, or uh, defer to John Wheeler. Uh, we have a, a men's sweep activity on Wednesdays, and uh, John, you're a participant in that. And am I correct in saying that events like that, Dave, that members participate in, they really wouldn't be very possible logistically if you had every other tea time. I mean, we we went down that road before, and that's why I think uh, our new direction has been overall pretty successful. Uh, John, could you speak to that? Am I correct? Good, but then I'll defer to Jack uh, to, to Jack Connolly too. It's it's. I think that um, uh, as as someone who plays and is who has a tea time tomorrow for May forty, okay that uh, um, they have so many people who want to get access uh, and that system allows us to mix and mingle and to get on the course um, that having the chunks is, is the only way to do it. Otherwise, you'd have tea times until four o'clock in the afternoon. And, and that certainly would not be something which would be workable, it really wouldn't be. But I don't know, I, I'd defer to Jack on that one, so. You know, I mean, we're, we're averaging 120 people a week or over 120 people a week in those, in that sweeps tournament. And, um, you know, Roland's been generous enough to grant us that time. And, and, and uh, if it was every other tea time, I really think it would be virtually impossible to complete that in the, in the course of a day if you adhere to that guideline. Okay. Uh well, you know, I appreciate I one uh, follow up question on the, uh, the remaking of the red tees. Uh, I understand that, you know, Mark put together a, a large, you know, plan for $250,000 or thereabouts. But in right. the past, you have made some small improvements on certain tees, like on 17, for example. And I, I wonder whether without, you know, putting off for five years, the $250,000 improvement, you couldn't pick some of the more uh, ridiculously long holes like number eight from the red tees and in a few others and, and, and have that done, uh, you know, as you have done like on 17 in the past. Thank you. Roman? We've, I've yeah, absolutely. I think that's good advice and I, I encourage the committee to um, keep working on our priorities list and I, I think that is good advice because I think that as Clem mentioned, you know, in, eventually we'd like to get to a point where that entire plan was complete but right now we've decided to focus on the real infrastructure needs of the golf course um we we could look at um chunking out that project or, or addressing some of the more immediate needs with it I, I i think that's a good good uh thing to look at so clem in the future uh, meetings let's let's keep digging into that priority list and uh see if we want to put you know a few t-boxes on there roman uh 
you know, we'll, we'll take that under advisement. I think it's a, an excellent point. Gentlemen, if, the, if there aren't any, aren't any other uh, points of business to bring before the committee, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn or Ken? Well, just real quickly, you asked me a question. I'm not sure I answered it correctly, Clem. I believe that's the, the golf committee's charter. You asked me if that was the town charter. I think the golf committee has a charge. I saw it online. Yeah, we have a charge, uh, exactly. Uh, you know, and maybe that's, well, and you, that's and I, you and I can collaborate on the utilization. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it's something certainly I uh, am glad you made us aware of. So uh, I'll entertain that motion to adjourn if it's appropriate. So moved. Okay. And uh, second? Thank you. Uh, gentlemen, thanks. Thanks for everybody's uh, involvement. And uh, pass the word along uh, October 20th, uh, the rates and fees. And uh, and I say this kind of tongue in cheek, but sadly it will be a, a virtual meeting. Uh, if we have a lot of participants, uh, I, I also would encourage anyone, especially just like this meeting, Ken uh, or Dave, uh, if you have you know, suggestions and, and you choose to put them in writing, please do that as well. If we, if, for example, if we got cut off today, uh, at least I could share those with the committee in advance. Gives it the committee, a, a, you know, the added advantage of being able to assess what points you're trying to make or, or bring forward to the committee. So thanks again. How would Clem, we I, think we to take a vote. Clem, I think we have to take the vote on the motion to adjourn. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Paul. Uh, so all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Uh, meetings adjourned. Thank, Thank you, you, John.